We identified different types of bias and random error in clinical research. We differentiated between intention to treat and per protocol analysis. Now, given a superiority clinical trial, evaluate its internal validity. When we evaluate the internal validity, we're basically evaluating how serious was the risk of bias. Now, here's a methodology from JAMA Evidence. JAMA is the Journal of American Medical Association, and they have formulated a systematic way to appraise a randomized clinical trial. Now, in order to minimize the risk of bias, we want to make sure that the groups that we are comparing have the same prognosis. We want to make sure that they have the same prognosis at the beginning of the study, during the study, and after the completion of the study. So the first question to ask is, did intervention and control groups start with the same prognosis? Now, this is a general question, so the next three questions are actually more specific in order to answer that question. Now, one of the best ways to make sure that the two groups are similar are by the process of randomization. However, randomization alone is not enough. So the next question to ask is, was randomization concealed? Now, keep in mind that this is referring to concealing of the randomization process itself. It's not referring to the blinding system or the blinding of the study. Now, by concealing the randomization process, we just make sure that people who are responsible for recruitment do not uh, systematically enroll uh, seeker patients to either a treatment or control group because then the patients will not have the same prognosis in both groups. The next question to ask is, were patients in the study group similar with respect to non-prognostic factors? This is where we actually evaluate the baseline characteristics, which is uh, usually provided in table one, sometimes in table two, but it's important to look at those baseline characteristics. Now, usually in the smaller studies, you're more likely to encounter groups that do not have balanced baseline characteristics. The larger study, the more likely that the two groups will be uh, similar uh, in regards to baseline characteristics. Occasionally, when randomization process doesn't result in similar groups as far as baseline characteristics, there are statistical techniques that can be applied and adjust for those imbalances. Now, as the study progresses, it's important that the two groups continue to remain uh, similar uh, with, as far as prognostic uh, fact. And that's where blinding comes into play. It's important to have blinding or masking of the study in order to maintain prognostic balance. So studies that are open label basically do not have any blinding. Now some studies could be single blind or it could be double blind where both investigator and participants uh, will be blinded. Please take a moment to review these definitions before you move on to the next slide. And finally, we want to make sure that the groups are prognostically balanced at the study's completion. It's important to evaluate how many patients were lost to follow up because that could uh, compromise the study. And I'll show you an example on the next slide. The real concern is are patients lost to follow up because you know they died and we don't know about it? Is, or is it because they are doing really well and they're not following up because they actually uh, you know, cured their disease and they moved on with their life? We also want to evaluate if a, uh, if a study was stopped early because that could uh, lead to overestimating the treatment effect. Now imagine we have two trials, uh, both trials uh, have a treatment group and a control group with a thousand patients in each and uh, they had the same number of loss to follow up. So let's say 30 patients in each group were lost to follow up. Now the primary endpoint in these two studies let's imagine is mortality. In trial A, a lot of people died. So 200 people in the treatment group died and 400 people in the control group died, leading to a 50% relative risk ratio. Now compare that to uh, trial B, where uh, it had the same number of loss to follow up, but the number of deaths were actually much smaller. So only 30 patients died in the treatment group and 60 patients died in the control group, resulting to a 50% relative uh, risk reduction. Now. The question is, what happened to the people who were lost to follow up? In order to do uh, sensitivity analysis, we can actually consider the worst case scenario, meaning that we can actually consider those 30 patients to have died 
you know, we I assume the worst case scenario. So the reason they haven't come back to follow up uh, is because they die. So if we actually add this to the number of deaths, uh, when you, when the number of deaths are very high, it actually makes minimal difference. So, you know, when you add those numbers, you actually get the relative risk reduction of 43%, which is similar to 50. Now, in the study B, where the number of deaths was very small, when we add those numbers of the loss to follow up, you actually double the number of deaths. So that's going to have a huge impact on the results when we do the sensitivity analysis. That's why it's important to consider the number of patients who were lost to follow up when evaluating clinical trials. And lastly, we want to make sure that the patients were actually analyzed in the groups to which they were randomized. This is where the concept of intention to treat comes in, where any patient who um, you know, actually was assigned to the medication will be included in the analysis regardless of whether they took the medication or not. Here are ways to reduce uh, the risk of bias in uh, clinical trials. So at the start of the study, we wanted groups to be similar. So we do randomization with uh, stratification. And then as the study uh, uh, proceeds, we want to use blinding of the patient, of caregivers, assessors of the outcomes. And then at the completion, we want to ensure complete follow-up, completing study as initially planned by sample size calculation, and including all patients whom data are available in the arm to which they were randomized. And here's a summary of the beneficial effects of these techniques. So for example, randomization will ensure uh, prognostic balance between the groups at baseline, reduces selection bias, reduces confounding bias. Uh, blinding maintains prognostic balance between the groups, reduces placebo effect, reduces uh, co-intervention, reduces bias in assessment of outcomes, and so forth.